Good morning uh, to a wonderful audience, and thank you all again for joining us for Boutiques on Wednesdays. We have a fantastic panel discussion here for you today with some of the top boutique managers in SA looking at multi-asset mandates, focusing on balance mandates. So this will cover all asset classes, which include strategic and tactical asset allocation. As we have multiple participants on the call today, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to post it in the Q&A box. Uh, but if there's a specific question to a specific panelist, uh, please just remember then to add the name or to who you're directing that question with or to, otherwise we'll assume it's open to the entire panel. It is my great privilege to welcome our moderator for the session today, Michael Dodd, Senior Fund Specialist at Morningstar Investment Management, South Africa. Good morning, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you well? I'm good, Eugene. How are you doing? Absolutely fantastic. Michael, thank you so much for coming through today and moderating this panel. And it, uh, a lot of work went into it from your side as well. So thank you for that. And thank you for your time today in sharing uh, your thoughts on the panel and where we're going with multi-asset funds. We're really looking forward to this session. If you're ready, you can start by introducing your panel. Perfect. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, I think it's going to be a good one. And good morning to uh, everyone who's joining us on the webinar this morning. As Eugene has said, we're here to talk about multi-asset class portfolios. So talking specifically to um, balanced funds um, in particular that the, uh, the four fund managers that are represented here manage today. Um, they are four balanced funds that are top performers in their uh, specific sections as well. So if you look at, at the uh, the performance of the various balance funds that we're going to be showcasing today, all four of them top quartile managers um, over the last three years. So we've got people here who know what they're talking about. Um, and I think without much further ado, we're going to kick the panel off, I think, just with a, a quick intro um, from all the managers, so maybe two to three minutes on them introducing their um, particular balance fund, how they think about asset allocation um, as it relates to the benchmarks of their funds. Um, so that I'm not showing any favoritism, I'm going to go in the reverse alphabetical order of the, um, the different uh, fund management houses. So that means we're going to start with Vizio and uh, Vizio represented here today by Jonathan Myerson. Um, Jonathan is the head of fixed income at Vizio and is a portfolio manager on the Vizio BCI balance fund alongside Patrice Moyal. The fund is benchmarked um, against the ASISA category average, so that being the South African multi-asset high equity um, category. So um, Jonathan, over to you, just uh, two minutes, a quick introduction on the Vizio balance fund, how you think about positioning the fund from an asset allocation perspective, given your benchmark. Um, and how much do the peers that you're trying to beat or outperform influence your asset allocation thinking? Good morning. Um, thank you um, and welcome, everyone. So the um, Vizio Balance Fund um, was launched um, just over three years ago, and it's really, um, I suppose, the, the one place that you get um, all the um, specialist um, knowledge that Vizio has in the different asset classes. We have specialists in property, fixed income, equity, both domestic and global. And this is where it kind of all comes together. Um, the approach is a strategic asset allocation approach. Um, the benchmark is, as you mentioned, the, the peer group, but really the um, objective is to perform in line with CPI plus five. So basically the objective of the fund is to ensure that investors um, put their money in a place where down the line, they will have preserved the, the, the wealth and assets and gain some, um, some upside from that. Um, Vizio is what we call a, I suppose, a bottom up uh, house. So the approach is um, a strategic asset allocation, essentially gives us rail guards around what we should be holding in the fund over a longer period of time. And the idea is that theoretically, um, the work shows that if you model it, the, the passive holdings over a long period of time should give you that CPI plus five. Then we bring the skills in the different teams and try and actually provide a little bit more than that CPI plus five. And to be honest, at times, those skills are required to just achieve the CPI plus five. You know, I'm sure we'll be discussing whether CPI is achievable or not. We think it is, but certainly it requires um, very detailed bottom up as well as some macro overlay to ensure that you kind of, we don't lose the site and try 
Um, and, and I think it's also very important to point out that while CPI plus five is certainly the objective, um, we do it within a first certain risk um, environment. We, we can't take overly big risk to achieve that CPI plus five. So that's a very, and, and you know, I think strategic asset allocation when it comes to, to balance funds is, is a, the absolute um, most, and I'm sure there might be disagreements, I think, um, you know, it's, it's a particularly important kind of framework to work, uh, to work within. So I think that kind of um, gives you the, the, the flavor of kind of what we do um, at, at Visio when it comes to the balance fund. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That's a, a good intro. Um, next up on the panel is Paul Bossman from Granite. Uh, Paul is a portfolio manager on the Granite BCI uh, balance fund alongside Vinesh and Naidu and Bronwyn Blood. Um, the Granite Fund is explicitly benchmarked against CPI plus five, so quite similar to uh, to Jonathan and Vizio in terms of the return objective that you are trying to achieve. So, um, Paul, maybe two minutes to introduce us to the Granite Balance Fund, um, how the benchmark that you have translates into your asset allocation thinking, and, and maybe your thoughts on how achievable CPI plus is as a, um, as a target. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michael, and thanks for having me on your panel today. Um, yeah, so our, our target is inflation plus five with no strategic asset allocation um, guardrails. Um, the reason being that opportunities move around in the market, and we don't think one should have a static stencil that you apply when opportunities are, by definition, fluid. Uh, so if the opportunities move, we're going to move to where the opportunities are. Um, for that, you need a, a multi-asset team. So we've got a team that's highly skilled in fixed income property domestic and global equities. So you can only move to opportunities if you know where they are and you can find them and you can do deep work on them. Um, but the other extreme is that if you're running a balanced fund and you're running very low equity exposures, you're probably timing the market. That's really more a view on where the market is rather than a bottom-up process. Because if you can invest up to 45% offshore, the globe is big, there will be offshore equity opportunities. Um, so our equity allocation will naturally be high over time um, because we're convinced you will find at least 45% of the opportunity of the fund can be filled with equities. And therefore the equity exposure will probably be quite a bit higher than that. Um, to your second question, in terms of how achievable it is, well, from where we are today, it looks it certainly looks very, achie very achievable. If you look at your, if you look at the opportunity sets across the assets, um, Long bonds are offering 12%, which could prove to be inflation plus five, inflation plus six over the next number of years. Property is just coming out of a out of a cycle. It's very cheap. There are tremendous opportunities there. Um, you could easily achieve double digit returns from property for many years to come. Um, and then if we look at, at our equities, our, our earnings yield on our, on our portfolio equities and property combined is about eight and a half percent. For us, that's a a broad estimate of the kind of return you can expect from those equities on a real basis. Um, so if you look across the, the stack of assets, asset opportunities, and you combine that into a balanced fund, it certainly seems achievable from where we are at the moment. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, we're gonna move on to the next panelist. And as we work down the list, reverse alphabetically, that is Jacobus Lecoq from Fairtree. Um, Jacobus is a multi-asset portfolio manager at Fairtree and the portfolio manager on the Fairtree Balance Fund. The fund, similar to Visio, is also benchmarked against um, peers um, and against the CISA category average. So Jacobus, maybe just some opening remarks from you on how you think about things at Fairtree uh, from an asset allocation perspective and, and how much does the peer group influence your um, asset allocation positioning? Yes, thank you, Michael, and uh, good morning to everyone online. So <clears throat> the journey of our balance fund started in 2017, and it was really a culmination of bringing all the different specialists within the business into one long only product. Um, if you think about the fund and what it tries to achieve, this is an high equity balance fund with a C5 plus, plus five return target. So if you think about the objectives, first of all, this is a high growth capital appreciation delivering fund. And therefore, 
from an SAA, strategic asset allocation perspective, a high amount of the assets need to be allocated towards growth asset classes. So how do we get there? Well, when we do the modeling of and optimizing the fund, there's three things you try to optimize for. First is the normal risk adjusted, trying to enhance or optimize your, for your risk adjustment returns. Um, but secondly, and even more importantly, we try to optimize for actually hitting that CPI plus five target. Um, so increasing the probability of getting to the CPI plus five, and that is a high weight in the risk adjusted return um, aim. So what that means is that often you get a portfolio with more exposure towards growth assets than your maximized risk adjusted return portfolio, but it enhances that probability of actually getting to that to that target. Um, we think then ab about tactical asset allocation as trying to preserve capital. So we will only be really aggressive on tactical asset allocation when we do think we're going into a, a recession scenario or an earnings contraction, then we'll move more aggressively um, and allow our specialists um, to produce the alpha in the, in, in the product. Um, over time, 80% of the alpha from the product will come from security selection and say about 10, 20% will come from, from asset allocation. So bringing this all together, I think, um, you know, talking about CPI plus five, is it achievable? Over the last 10 years, I think a normal 70, 30 portfolio has just about not get to the CPI plus five. So you do need active managers to provide additional alpha to your product to get to that CPI plus five. And that's why I think um, it is achievable. We have shown in the past that, that, that we can provide alpha consistently over time. And from the different teams and bringing them together, I think it is, it is it's possible. Thanks very much, Jacobus. Um, and moving on to our final panelist, so last but not least, um, Nick DeFoss from uh, Centaur Asset Management. Nick is a senior analyst in the Centaur team. Um, his work contributing to the positioning on the Centaur BCI Balanced Fund that is managed by Roger Williams. In contrast to some of the other, other panelists today, um, this fund has a composite asset class benchmark. So it is 48% South African equities, 25% South African bonds, 11% cash and 16% offshore equities. Um, Nick, I think a, a quick introduction to the central balance fund from your perspective and how the composite benchmark influences um, or anchors your thinking on asset allocation for the fund. And does that implicitly tie to a return target like the uh, the other guys do, does? Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks to BCI for hosting this. Um, yeah, so just a brief introduction. Uh, the balance fund was founded around 2013. Um, has about 1.6 billion under management. Um, you know, maybe a bit of an interesting story how the balance fund came about. Um, you know, the business has quite a few legacy uh, private client portfolios. And at the time, a few of them were looking for, as they became older, were looking for a place to, to park retirement savings in and wanted a bit of offshore exposure as well. That was, that's part of the reason why the, the balance fund came into existence. Um, so in terms of the benchmark, as you mentioned, it's a composite benchmark. Um, I think it's probably best answered if I explain how we kind of built this benchmark. So what we've done is we look at an efficient frontier. Um, you run you know, various scenarios depending on what you think kind of like expected returns for the, the various asset classes are. And then we back tested that. So we wanted the benchmark uh, which is our strategic asset allocation to meet a few various criteria. So the one being an objective of beating CPI plus 4%. Uh, we also wanted the benchmark to, to beat the average SA balance fund. Uh, so to be within top quartile performance. I think we'll be really pleased if we achieve a top decile performance uh, over a, a long period of time. Um, so that's really how we put it together. And then in terms of generating alpha, you know, above and beyond that, we use tactical asset allocation to, to move around that, the, 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 the various composite uh, positions that we have. Great. Thanks, Nick. I think that gives us a, a decent um, overlay of how all the, the four panelists approach their particular funds and, and how things get managed. And I think 
If we can, what I'd like to do now is just do a quick uh, whirlwind through some of the main asset classes um, and looking at some of the current positioning that the um, that the, the managers have in their funds and contrasting some of the, the fairly differentiated positioning that comes through um, in, uh, in some of the, the balance funds that are managed today. So I think let's start with bonds. Um, and for this, I'm going to come back to Jonathan. Um, who is the, the fixed income specialist. And also, I think largely because Vizio has the highest overall allocation to bonds amongst the four balance funds that are being showcased here today. Um, I think, Jonathan, the Vizio fund also has a, a fairly interesting allocation within bonds is that in that that is not exclusively South African bonds. You've got a decent mix of both South African and offshore positioning. And the, the offshore component is a bit of a differentiator relative to some of your peers here today. Um, the period of TINA, uh, the, there is no alternative um, in the, the global market might be behind us in the global context. So Jonathan, maybe just you're thinking around the bond positioning, particularly the offshore bond component. Um, what are you finding attractive that dictates that particular asset allocation? So just to, to round up what we spoke about earlier, just to clarify, and I think three out of the speak, um, two out of the other speakers mentioned it, um, strategic asset allocation does not constrain the fund by any means, because tactical asset allocation ensures that you move around that. So there's no kind of rigidity around that. Uh, in terms of, I'm glad you mentioned Tina, because um, Tina is out and Barbie's in. Bonds are back, really in earnest. And, you know, for, for years, um, you know, the, that you, you, there was nothing to do with the money. It, it mean, you had to be in equities because money market and bonds were giving you pretty much zero, certainly um, in hard currency. Um, the, the way we look at it, and it's kind of linked to the, the whole approach of, you know, we, we, are, we, we're very cognizant of downside risks as well. So when we look at the asset classes, um, expected returns given valuations, um, we look to see which of the asset classes are more likely to give you the objective given um, you know, the environment we're in. And currently with South African bonds that yields at uh, you know, above 12%, we think that they are more likely to give us our CPI plus five in the next 12 to 18 months than, than equities, even domestically. Domestic equities are not particularly expensive, but I don't think they're cheap either. Globally, it's actually maybe an easier uh, call to make because they actually, global equities are, are expensive. You know, to justify, uh, PE ratios at current you know, uh, multiples, um, given the interest rate environment, is extremely difficult to, to kind, of, um, kind, of, kind of accept. So, you know, for by example, way of example is we expect domestic equities and domestic bonds over the next 12 to 18 months to actually return the same, um, to, to have the same return. But given the framework, you're going to get that return with much more volatility in equities than in bonds. So that, that explains the domestic um, um, kind of approach. And you know, I can go into lots of details. It's not that we're not worried about what's happening in the bond market. We're very worried of fiscal, um, kind of the, the fiscal outlook and so on. But you know, that will affect all asset classes. Um, when we look at the global and why we are, we still underweight global bonds versus the benchmark, uh, sorry, versus our strategic assets allocation at 6% versus 10. Um, but there, it's partly a function of diversification because, you know, the, the world has moved from worrying about the U.S. recession to kind of soft landing and so on. But there's still a tail risk of the landing being slightly less soft, and it might not be happening in the next three to six months, but maybe for slightly further out. So we get a decent yield in dollars. And at the same time, we got some hedge against our equity positions, because if we do get into a recession, um, bonds are actually going to perform very well, and they'll they will basically um, cushion some of the, the pain that you might get um, from equities. So domestically, we five percent overweight the strategic asset allocation in bonds, and we long duration. Um, globally, we are underweight at six percent, which is actually the long the the, the most overweight. Sorry, the, the highest exposure still underweight we've had since the, the inception of the fund, and we've only recently moved actually slightly longer duration. So we're actually holding bonds with a ten year maturity. And that's, you know, the, the, and the decision to be more overweight in bonds is not because one of the fund managers is a bond manager, it's because of the asset allocation uh, framework makes sense for us to be um, in, in, you know, in these assets. Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. I mean, maybe, 
maybe to contrast that, and Nick, I'm going to bring you um, back in here. The the central fund also has a fairly healthy allocation to bonds. Um, that is, in in I guess bias towards the South African holdings, though. From from looking at your fact sheet, there's no offshore bond holdings. It's all um, in South African bonds. So I'd I'd be interested to hear your views here as well. Does it do you align with Jonathan um, in terms of you know the thinking there is the is the valuation on offer offsetting some of the fiscal risks that are present um, and where on the curve um, I guess are you taking your South African bond position? Uh, thanks, Michael. So look, I mean, we in, in terms of strategic asset allocation, that, that number that you mentioned earlier in the introduction, our benchmark is twenty five percent to all be. So we're not taking a massive overweight bet there. And I don't think you ever will see us. We're sitting at around 26% at the moment. Um, you know, you'll never really see us taking big bets kind of like either way around that. Our focus is predominantly on the equity side of the business. Um, but, you know, I think I agree with a lot of what Jonathan said. Uh, specifically in SA, you've got very good real yields on offer at the moment, you know, anywhere between 10 and, and 12%. And this just goes back to that, you know, where the balance funds can meet a CPI plus five hurdle. I mean, essentially, the, the long bonds are giving you that at the moment. Um, you know, offshore, we don't have any bonds, like you've said. But I think what is quite interesting is in the balance fund, we currently have around 9% uh, hard currency cash uh, sitting offshore. Um, you're getting about 5% on that. And... Our view is actually to bring a bit of that cash back into South Africa at the appropriate level, because we are turning more positive on, on SA equities. And if the offshore market does play out like we think we do, we might get another period where you see a bit of volatility in the RAND that gives you that opportunity to, to bring it back and to deploy it here. But we're now very happy to be receiving a, a 5% kind of yield on cash and, and hard currency. Um, and, you know, it's also like Jonathan said earlier, you know, there's, there are the other things at the moment. It's no longer the, the Tino where you know, equities are the, the only game in town. So, so happy to be sitting and, and waiting with those fixed income and, and cash, cash positions. Sure. Um, Paul, I'm going to come to you because uh, the, the Granite Fund is quite differently positioned. You are less of a fan of bonds um, than, than some of your peers. But, uh, but in particular, if we move on to property in particular, that's a... A sector where Granite have a fairly healthy allocation. Um, Fifteen percent of the fund is in property, six percent in South African property, and nine percent offshore. Um, for an asset class that has fallen out of favour um, in, I guess, a lot of people's eyes, that's a it's a fairly chunky allocation and very different to how your peers are positioned. So, Paul, I think, what are you seeing here that makes you so constructive on the property sector? Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe just to to pick up from from Jonathan. I mean, we we fully agree that Barbie is real. Um, we do hold bonds, and we we actually hold uh, up to well, seventeen percent of the fund is in bonds, um, of which three percent is linkers and the rest is nominals. But uh, my wife went to watch Barbie last Friday afternoon, um, and she came back and told me it really is great. But I did sit thinking what she could have alternatively done with that time. Um, and that to me is, is with bonds, opportunity cost at the moment is quite high because even though bonds are offering you a very good opportunity, um, property is offering an exceptional opportunity. So, and equities as well. So that's why we, we are invested in bonds and we think it's a very good idea. We just think that by the time bonds have given you inflation plus five or six, uh, over the next five years, property is potentially giving you inflation plus 10. Um, and I'll explain why this is our thinking. So obviously in the short run, uh, property is, is known as safe as houses, but in the long run, it, it behaves like a commodity, um, a pure commodity actually. And as we know, commodities trade in cycles and then there's human emotion in the markets around these cycles. And that emotion is quite significant. Um, so an asset class or a commodity is typically loved or hated. Um, and when it's loved, everybody loves it. And when it's hated, it's very broadly hated. So that creates opportunities because when there's huge emotion in markets, um, there's, there's often a mispricing. So what makes property such a unique opportunity at the moment 
is that most of the property companies we own are back to paying dividends and the dividend yields are, are double digits. Um, so that, that you're going to earn. Then as the price normalizes towards net asset value, um, which we think it should, you looking at a, a discounts of, of 40% in net asset value and sometimes greater than that. So you get that gradual move towards NAV. And then the net asset values have been written down given where we are in the interest rate cycle um, and due to weak demand for the for the property. So those net asset values also get written up gradually. Uh, so when you when you invest in property at the beginning of a, of a cycle that's turning, you can do phenomenally well. Um, so that's why we've got more or less 16% of, of our fund in, in, um, in property, of which 9% is offshore and, and 6% is domestic. Thanks, Paul. Um, to move on to your Quirbus, um, and in picking out a, an, an asset class for you, I'm going to come to, to South African equity on that. Um, it's the of the four funds that are here today, the Fair Tree Fund is holding the most um, in South African equity, uh, around 44% in SA equity versus just 21% in uh, the offshore equivalent, so offshore equity. Um, in contrast to Paul, not a lot of enthusiasm for property in the fund, though there is a, a fairly uh, fairly small holding. So I guess, where are you and where are Fairtree finding opportunities uh, within this space and what drives this particular fund positioning? Right, <clears throat> we need to look at the positioning within the context of the whole, whole fund. So if you think about how we think about the world at the moment, <clears throat> we think we need to be more defensively positioned um, so therefore, from an overall portfolio perspective, we are overweight bonds, underweight equities. Within that equity component, we express that underweight more so via global equities, um, given the high valuations, the problems with, with inflation, the high and aggressive hiking cycle that we've seen globally, which we think will still play out. You know, we think there's long, variable lags that will, that will still play out. So from that perspective, we are underweight global, but we are neutral to maybe slightly underweight SA, SA equity. And within SA equity, it's not SA Inc. It is very diversified across resources, global diversifieds, global consumer, and then um, um, SA Inc. So SA Inc. is about 30% at the moment. We've built that position from a very much an underweight uh, more recently. So we started to see more opportunities on the SA Inc. front. Uh, we think valuations are very attractive. And the three things which we are focusing on, if we take a 12 month view, is one, we're most likely going to see rate cuts. We're very close to the, to the peak of the cycle in South Africa. Um, real rates are close to 3%, typically where they've peaked in the past and they haven't stayed there for a very long time. Um, and those rate cuts will start to support SA Inc. Secondly, we do think the electricity situation are improving. We've done a lot of work in terms of all the new electricity uh, that will potentially come online even with very um, conservative assumptions, if you add on potentially um, some of the improvements that ESCOM can or the easy low hanging fruit that, that, that can be gained, we do think that, um, that load shedding are peaking this year and, um, and is running out and fading over the next few years. And that will improve the profit margins of some of these businesses that has been hampered down this year. Um, and then on the resource side, we do think Again, those are very diversified um, towards energy, so oil, um, gold companies, as well as diversified miners playing to different themes. You can think about gold as being a defensive position, um, also will benefit when the Fed starts to, starts to cut rates. Um, energy, also defensive from a geopolitical perspective. OPEC keeping very disciplined in, in, in their production cuts. So playing different macro themes out there, we're seeing those opportunities very diversified across the, the SA Inc spectrum. But for local equities, um, I think that's probably where we've seen the biggest change more recently, where we've started to add local to the retailers and to the banks. Thanks, Yoko. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use this as a segue into talking about something that is, I think, still quite top of mind uh, for a lot of people and probably a lot of people listening on the call, and that's the the offshore allocations within the funds. So I think as a reminder for the audience, and, and, and unless you've been under a rock for the last year, you'll be aware that the uh, the offshore limits and the offshore, uh, the amount that you can hold offshore in the funds increased last year from 30% to a maximum of 45%. Uh, 
Um, it's been quite interesting from my perspective, from a, I guess, a manager research and a fund perspective, just to see the differing approaches of South African managers to this over the last year. Uh, the general observation that I would make on that is that the we've seen a very gradual increase um, in managers' offshore weightings, but very few have been um, running out the door and, and looking to, to take their, their offshore weights to their full allowance. Um, in fact, of the four funds that are being showcased here today, only one um, is sitting close to the 45% maximum threshold, and we will come to that. Um, but I think, Jonathan, maybe to, to come back to you, I think particularly on the offshore allocation and um, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk and commentary around what the optimal offshore number is. Uh, what is the right number to to have offshore? I mean, does does Visio have an optimal number? Does such a thing exist um, in a, I guess, an asset allocation framework? And, and specifically, as as it talks to your strategic asset allocation around looking to achieve CPI plus five. And I guess since the regulatory changes, just how has the thinking around the offshore allocation changed in-house since those changes were announced? So, so the, um, the previous um, you know, Reg 28, with, with, um, which limited our foreign exposure, meant that it, we were never optimally positioned um, on offshore. In other words, the max exposure that we were allowed was below what we found to be the kind of optimal strategic asset allocation to offshore. Um, so it meant that um, you know, it gives us now the, the freedom to be overweight at times when we want offshore or underweight, which we've always been underweight, but obviously um, the cap meant, the, the lower cap meant that we, um, we couldn't be overweight. So the, we took our time, we looked at, we analyzed it, and uh, we basically came up with a number of 35% um, as a uh, kind of um, optimal strategic asset allocation for, for offshore. And we gradually moved, um, you know, in that direction. And it, and the move was, I think, like you mentioned, it was, it was a function of kind of where the values lay. So I think it has given um, domestic um, managers the opportunity to, you know, be more tactical around the global um, exposure. Obviously, you know, there the are lots of um, byproducts of, of um, those moves. And, you know, we can talk about... Uh, you know, how it's increased risk and what uh, skills that you, you had to have for that. But um, I think they, they've worked reasonably well in our favor. So we can talk about that later as well. But that's kind of how we, we looked at it. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. I think, Nick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you in here as well. I mean, Jonathan mentioned that the, the offshore limit obviously opens things up quite significantly for local investors in these kinds of vehicles in terms of the opportunity set. Do you think that there are any potential unintended consequences from the heightened offshore limit? And does this potentially create any opportunities uh, in, in your view in, in the local space? Uh, good question. Um, so, I mean, if, if we look at what's kind of been happening in South Africa over the past couple of years, you've had a very negative sentiment Kind of like from everyone, including SA fund managers, towards towards let's call it SA Inc. Um, you know, guys have been a bit crowded in in the RAND hedges, um, and what this increased offshore allowance does is it creates a bit of an opportunity. I mean, we're doing it, and I'm sure a bunch of other managers are also doing it, where you're able to buy an offshore counter. Uh, and kind of like replicate a local one. So, you know, instead of owning a Sassel locally, you know, we own a Repsol. We do own Sassel a bit locally, but mainly Repsol and, and Shell offshore. So when you don't have these dual listings, you, you, you are seeing kind of like divergence in performance. So Sassel, Sappy, uh, probably a good example of that. Um, and then you've had the foreigners selling SA equity down, um, you know, with all the negative you know, news headlines and everything we're all aware of here in South Africa. And now this offshore limit has allowed you to take, you know, this 45% offshore and Morgan Stanley actually tracks it. I think the number sitting on average across balance funds, not just over 40% uh, versus being below or at 30% uh, a few years ago. So there's been this big flow of money uh, out of South Africa. So th there's a fundamental argument, but I'm just going to talk about the flow argument. Um, now, there is a scenario that could potentially play out where 
things in South Africa turn out not as bad as as what everyone thinks they would be. Um, and you know, we that's actually our view that the things aren't going to turn out as bad. And if you get a scenario where guys change their strategic asset allocation and bring money back into South Africa, they're already holding a lot of these big RAND hedges. So that's not might not be where the money flows to. And in all likelihood, the money might flow into miners and flow into the SA Inc. names. Now, with all this money flowing out, the SA Inc. names specifically have become very liquid. So you could have this very big positive cocktail, both on the fundamental side and on the flow side, where money flows into these SA Inc. names and it almost becomes like a kind of like a, a rush into a very small funnel. It have quite a Lollapalooza effect on the up. Um, if it plays out that way. So something you know that that comes across as quite negative seems like it's it's created an opportunity. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna come to Paul next. Um, I did say that there was one fund here utilizing the the full forty five percent that uh, that is allowed, and that's uh, that's Paul's fund on the granite side. Um, Paul, I mean you. We've, we've heard a lot of arguments here today for the attractiveness of South African assets. Um, and you've heard Nick's, Nick's views here on the, the, the potential for, I guess, if there's a sentiment change, um, that, that things could be, um, you know, think that could benefit the, the, the South African assets quite materially. Um, you're sitting with a fairly large allocation to offshore equities, so 33% and plus your, your property allocation that we've already discussed. I'm keen to hear your views here on the offshore positioning in your funds. Um, is it top-down driven, bottom-up driven? Um, are you finding better opportunities offshore than you than you can here? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, if you were to, to walk into the, the office of a financial advisor in London and with your portfolio uh, all in cash, um, he's very unlikely to recommend that you put 70 or 80% of that in South Africa. Um, and if he does, you're probably going to find a different financial advisor. Um, you know, even if he's got a positive view on South Africa, which we actually do have, it's just the, the globe is big and the opportunity set is massive and you are taking concentration risk in a specific geography. So our view is not a negative essay view. It's just the globe is big and there are many opportunities. And I mean, we find those opportunities. They're the, the rapid growth industries within which there are companies with competitive advantages um, for which you can make you know, good money for years and years to come. So, so it's more opportunity driven than a, a view on SA. Um, the one problem is that you have a mismatch between your inflation plus five benchmark and the RAND. So RAND's, you know, the RAND strength is, is a problem, especially if you're retiring in South Africa, you're going to retire in RAND. So it truly is a RAND liability. And for that reason, we're doing a, at the moment, we're doing a sort of a RAND hedge strategy. Um, not all of it, but, a, but more than half of that is actually hedged out on a RAND basis. We're doing it with options, so it's we still participate if the round weakens, but we protect it at certain levels against strength. Um, yeah, and, and and that's simply done to match to match the nature of the product, which is a domestic pension product. Thanks, Paul. Your covers are going to come to you. I think Paul brought up something that I think is quite relevant as well for a for a local investor, particularly with a higher offshore limit, and that is the currency. Um, and the the rand and the rand being one of the most volatile currencies in the world, um, and its strength or weakness can either obviously either dilute or amplify the offshore returns that you're getting in portfolios as a rand investor. Um, and I think this month is going to be a fairly interesting case in point where the rand has been phenomenally strong this month. Um, I guess in in contrast to to prior months, and and that's going to water down, I guess the the offshore component of the portfolio. So, I guess the the question being from a from an asset allocation perspective and how you're managing the balance funds, how should we be thinking about the rand? Um, should we be hedging the currency and hedging out the increased volatility that comes from the currency component of the portfolios, which now potentially is a lot larger? Very good question. I think very relevant topic at the moment. Um, 
Well, historically, people who invested in SA has often liked the uh, X RAN exposure. You know, it provides some sort of a defense to the portfolio. Um, if you think back 2001, 2008, 2011, 12, 15, 18, 22, and 20, these are years in which the RAND has depreciated by, say, 30 to 60%. So every three to four years, you get these blowout scenarios where you actually want to be and want to have some protection and the rent. So having an offshore exposure does provide that. During the pandemic, S&P 500 hedge to rent was down 20%. Um, S&P 500 in dollars was down 35% as, as one example. Um, and so from that perspective, S investors historically has thought about the rent as, as some sort of a hedge. So you need to incorporate and therefore keeping it unhitched. You need to incorporate a view about potentially the RAND's um, future and, and, and where it's moving towards. Going forward, um, with there being a high allocation towards these offshore assets, including allocations towards you know, US bonds, US cash, um, even global ag, I think those more less riskier asset classes um, if you keep them unhedged, the volatility of those asset classes actually double. So you need to think about the additional amount of risk you incorporate into your portfolio by keeping these more low risk asset classes unhedged. For equities, it's less so. You know, uh, US equities and US equities unhedged or hedged, the volatility remains fairly, fairly similar. So from a risk adjusted perspective, I think um, those asset classes um, it makes more sense to, to think about hedging those. For equities, um, studies have shown that the optimal hedge ratio is between 30% and 66%, depending on, on time, on period, on your risk appetite. Um, and so maybe a long term, uh, you know, would be around 50%. Our view at the moment is to keep it unhedged because we want that from our macro view, we want that um, hedge and, and exposure towards. Uh, potentially if there's rent weakness either from a global recession or if there's some domestic weakness that, that can come true. So that's how we position now, but thinking about the rent hedge in the future, I think is becoming more important for these different global asset classes. Yeah. Guys, I'm, I'm realizing I'm running short on time and still have so many questions to ask, but I think it would be remiss of me if I didn't come to the the, the topic of managing South African balanced portfolios in the context of being a boutique. Um, because one of the arguments that I've heard being put forward is that, you know, South African managers with the, the increased offshore allowance, um, are they best placed to cover offshore um, relative to a, you know, a, a big global manager or some of the bigger players in the market? And um, so Jonathan, maybe to, to bring you in here, I mean, what would your response be to that argument in terms of, you know, as a as a smaller boutique player, um, are you equipped to to cover the wide range of asset classes that in, that's needed to run a multi asset portfolio? Yeah, I think um, at Visio, you know, the, the equity team has been managing global um, stocks in in the hedge funds and in long only since uh, two thousand and four. So, you know, there certainly has been that type of experience. But, but I'm over and above that, um, I think even when you um, invest uh, in South African stocks, which is quite a limited universe, you're looking at them against global stocks. You, you're not going to analyze, I think uh, Yukubis, uh, Nick mentioned, um, SASA without looking at the global names as well. Um, so there's certainly been that coverage really. And then obviously on top of that, you know, 65% of earnings on the JSC come from uh, Kind of ran hedge counters, so we've always covered um, you know the, the Richmonds, the Naspos, the uh, um, AB Inviv. So I think um, there's you know it, it doesn't really matter where you sit um, as got, as long as you've got the team that has focused on that, and you know we we actually have uh, people offshore as well that um, look at, at the different stocks. So I don't think that's certain. I certainly don't think that's a reason um, not to be able to um, manage these type of balance and i think all four of us have proven that that's the case yeah absolutely and nick maybe just quickly from from your side i mean do you feel that as a smaller boutique you're at a, a disadvantage to some of the bigger players um with that may have a more dedicated capability in each asset class um 
maybe I'll answer it maybe a bit like simplistic, but I mean, if you think of the, the best investment house in the world run by two guys in their 90s, so, you know, I don't know whether you need specific teams sitting across the globe and specialist teams sitting in different areas uh, to run a fund. Um, you know, what we try and do is, we'll, on the offshore side, we'll stay away from businesses that have like a very specific localized niche. So, you know, if you find a retailer operating in a specific country selling a niche product you know maybe something like that we'll stay away from because we, we will find you know might not have a particular edge in that um but if you're looking at a business you know but like Jonathan mentioned a lot of the businesses that we look at are multinationals whether you're a fund manager sitting in the U.S. Uh, looking at a, a business like Apple uh, making profits essentially all over the world I don't know what you know, if you have much of an edge over someone sitting in South Africa looking at the same business. Uh, you also find offshore sell side covers businesses in, let's say, a lot more detail uh, and information disseminates across the market a lot more quickly and efficiently than what it does in South Africa. So I don't think there's much of a disadvantage uh, in terms of that. Um, and then, you know, a market where we might look at you know, specific business operating in the single market is we have an analyst sitting in the UK um, that's built up quite a, a good network of, of kind of the larger managers um, in that market. So, you know, we find that quite helpful, but by no means do you need to be sitting in a specific country, I think, to be analyzing a specific business. Um, you know, it's not like we're sitting in the 70s and 80s where, you know, having an integrated report would give you a competitive advantage. Thanks, guys. Eugene, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you back in if uh, if that's all right. I realize we've gone a little bit over time, and there are potentially a few um, questions in the Q and A that you might want to uh, might want to address. Yeah, Michael, you're more than welcome to take one or two of the questions in the Q and A box if you want to. I think we have another three or four minutes spare. Sure. I think a lot of the questions that have come through seem to be quite strategic asset allocation related. So um, I think maybe let's, let's ask you, Kourbis. Uh, so your Kourbis, in your sort of strategic asset allocation framework, one of the, um, the questions that has come through is, or maybe I'll group the two together, is, is around the role of asset classes that I guess are a little less, um, uh, I guess, traditional um, or, or ones that will have a longer history. So your views on the role of things like emerging market equities um, and inflation-linked bonds in a strategic asset allocation context for a fund that is uh, looking to target CPI plus five. Yes, I think you can expand that to maybe alternatives as well. You know, you need to think about the cost of getting access, um, <clears throat> the efficiency with which you can get it. Um, you know, what it brings to the overall portfolio in terms of, you know, diversification um, and, and do you have the, the skill set? Um, because I think as allocators, we allocate to beta, but as, as well as to, to alpha. Um, and so when you think about those, um, take em emerging markets as an example. We have an, a team that manages emerging market um, equities. have done really well, sit for the last 12 months at uh, alpha of 7% or 10%. Um, we're actually overweight EM within our um, our balance fund. So we've got a, an active position towards emerging markets as a as an as a, an off benchmark position. When we actually did the the optimization, we didn't get the allocation towards emerging markets because I think of the overlap with South African and SA Inc. Um, you know the similarities there. So it was natural to and, and we just left it out from from that perspective. The same happened with with inflation linked bonds. So you can ask yourself the question, do you want to allocate one or 2%? Is it going to make a difference to the portfolio? Or can you employ that capital somewhere else where you actually have a, a proven skill set? Um, in this case, for Ian, we, we did have it. So that's why we're overweight. Great. Um, maybe a, another question that's come through is on the rebalancing strategies um, of the various funds as it relates to, I mean, this is obviously you're going to have to take it in the context of both your strategic asset allocation and your, your tactical and your target allocations. 
Um, Jonathan, I'm going to come to you if that's all right on, on that one, given that your fund runs with a strategic asset allocation framework. Um, how often do you rebalance? Uh, what, what would trigger a rebalance of the, the allocation back to target? Yes, I, I have to, the previous question is about bonds, so I have to kind of to touch on that quickly. Um, so I agree with the Yakuba strategic asset allocation. Um, we look at it as the bond basket, um, and it's not um, specific kind of to, to inflationary bonds. We don't think they have a place in the strategic asset allocation, but they certainly have tactical times where we hold them. Uh, currently, we not particularly, uh, it, it's quite seldom actually that we like uh, inflationary bonds, to be honest. The nominals generally give us more that, than, um, than that. Um, also quickly in alternatives, which we didn't speak about, which is an asset class that's clearly uh, become important. And you know, we, we, we're lucky that we've got in-house data because we've been managing uh, hedge funds for 20 years. And we've been able to kind of incorporate that into the strategic asset allocation, given that you know the, C um, the um, Cisco um, might change there. And um, we, we're comfortable that when that gets um, basically passed, we'll be able to at least have 10% of, um, of um, the funds in hedge, in, in hedge uh, because it does um, show um, better returns with a lower uh, volatility. The kind of elusive uh, free um, lunch that um, Professor Markovitz spoke about all those years ago. So we, we like that. In terms of the strategic allocation and how we, um, when we adjust, it's it's not. There's no date for it. We we meet uh, as a as a team on a weekly basis, specifically to speak about um, the unconstrained. Sorry, the uh, the balance fund, um, and um, we generally run the numbers um, on a monthly basis. Uh, but it doesn't stop us um, to kind of when big moves happen um to to change that that's the tactical obviously the strategic asset allocation doesn't change over time it gets monitored um and you know over a pe long period of times it might but certainly that's not the idea of strategic asset allocation it's a tactical moves that happen and they don't have to be done you know in a calendar month or at a certain date or anything like that perfect um eugene i'm happy to throw it back to you yeah, fantastic. Uh, Michael, you've done a phenomenal job with your panel this morning. And many thanks again to Jonathan, Jakubas, Paul and Nick for your time this morning. Uh, you gave us all a lot of insight in terms of how you think about the various asset classes, uh, SAA and TAA. Uh, Michael, again, from our side, thank you so much for your time this morning and the time you spent preparing for the session. It's been really great. The audience out there, just a quick reminder again, uh, next week, Wednesday, the 2nd of August, we'll be touching again on income funds and bond funds, still very topical in client portfolios. Do you add more bonds or do you use a flexible income fund to do that for you with portfolio metrics? And then uh, if you haven't received the invites yet, please speak to the BCI team. We've got a special edition as well on the 16th of August uh, with all our global or offshore fund managers, uh, and again, should be proved to be very insightful. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been really great to have all of you with us, and we look forward to engaging with all of you again in the very near future. Until next week, Wednesday, we'll chat again. Keep safe and uh, keep it going. Thank you so much.